Oh, I don't have a Michaels Myers mask. Why did I say Michaels Meyer? You get it. Either way, you get it. It's the Halloween special. Hmm. Oh, man. Yep. It's the Halloween special. I've been planning this for a while. Super excited to jump into it. And I'm like, what do you do for a Halloween special? I did my Geek Wave episode for Halloween. Now I'm like, it's movie tales. We got to go big because it's the scariest time of year. What do you do when it comes to your horrific tales of the month? So this special is going to be Halloween themed. And by Halloween themed, I mean the three movie feature that we do usually on the podcast feed. That's going to be the case here again. This entire video is going to be all three episodes, all three, you know, movies. And I figured since it's Halloween, let's talk about the Halloween movies. Now, you can thank this episode, this special, you can dedicate it to AMC. You know, everyone's favorite American movie channel because every single movie I watched, they did a marathon for Halloween. So I'm like, hey... I was going to do this anyways, I'll spend a day watching all three of the movies in a row that they have for Halloween, and then I'll talk about them. So, we have Halloween, number one, from 1978, and then we have Halloween 2, the follow-up to that from 1981, I believe, and then, for some reason, we have Halloween Resurrections from 2002. So... Let's jump into the world of Halloween, because this franchise has been running forever, over 40 years now at this point. They are still making movies. Currently in theaters, there is a Halloween movie out on, on you know, your viewing pleasures. Go watch that. It just never ends. They literally made an entire concept uh, out of a guy who is a serial killer, and it's got like 10 movies. They have melted this thing dry and fast and hard to the point that it is almost impossible to care about, which we will get to as we go through these movies and these, oh my goodness, these interesting films. So we work, We will start with Halloween from 1978 because not only is it like a genre-defying film, everything post this movie tries to emulate this movie. Every slasher, every moderate character design of like the iconic look of the mask or the suit Everything tries to emulate what this was, because for all intents and purposes, and I will 100% mean this, the first Halloween film from 1978 is probably the best in the genre it creates. The slasher, the thriller, the all of it, this is where it's done right. It's the only time I feel it works in the entirety of the Halloween universe, because after this film, everything kind of sucks. <laughs> it's just... Completely lazy, completely dried out. But this movie, we have a very simple premise. You know, a serial killer, he kills his sister when he's a little young man. He gets locked away in an insane asylum because that's what you did back in the day when you killed someone. We're not sending them to death row. We're not sending them to prison. An insane asylum. We put him there. He breaks out the night of Halloween to, you know, just wreak havoc on the town that he's from. And I'm just like, that's a good premise. It's silly. It's scary. It's different. And it just works perfectly. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about John Carpenter while we're doing this thing, because of course this is the one he worked on, it is the first in the genre, everything about this film, I think the way it works is because of him, I think the way he used the POV shots, the way he used the music, and the way everything just culminated into this like beautifully terrifying piece, all comes from him, his great mind. I really like the camera work in this film. It's hard to capture that authentically, I feel, when you're doing, like, the POV shots, the long, dragged-out shots, and we're just waiting for that thing there. It's very rare that there's a jump scare in this original film. Like, it's just more about, like, the silent intensity of the horror and the situation that is building up our tension. It's not like, ah, here's the thing, ah, here we go. It's like, no, we know he escaped. We've seen the car that he crashed and the guy he killed to get there. We know he's walking through this town. We know he's out there. And every vague time we see him, it's incredibly intense and riveting. I love the POV shots where we're in the mask, where we're seeing a young Michael or an older Michael just going about his day. That is really good stuff. The, the way he is breathing on camera, it's, it's, it's scary. It's intense. And it works incredibly well. I think 
it is such a good film. It is so strong. The music score, again, I could talk about it all day. I think when you look at iconic horror scores, it's this and Jaws, right? There's there, there are other ones that are iconic, but they're not like this iconic where you can instantly recognize and you're just brought into that world. There isn't that for any of them. I really like that a lot. And of course, who is Michael here to go after? Why none other than Laurie Strode, of course. And this entire plot, it is so clearly the, you know, prototype for what's to come. Again, it could, I'm sure it happened before this, you know, the girl who is a little bit more careful in what she does with certain boys and certain aspects of her life. She is a babysitter. She is just like, hey, I'm not going to go kiss a boy on Halloween because I got to do this thing. And she is the archetype. We have parodied this archetype time and time again. She is, I think, the best of it just because there's actual nuance to her character. Like she wants to see a boy, but she doesn't want to like break her, you know, her babysitting vows, for lack of a better term, to see that guy. And it just works. And she's a great foil to Michael Myers because she's capable. She's not stupid. She's not running into trouble. She's not intentionally hurting herself. She is capable. She also realized this guy could kill her at any given moment. And she has to protect these kids that she's with because her other friend ditches her off of another kid to go kiss her boyfriend. (laughs) Right? Does that not sound familiar? It's everything in this genre. And it works really well. You know, it just feels authentic. It feels this is a real town, a small town where, you know, the sheriff's kind of an idiot He's not really doing anything to help anyone. He's just kind of showing up like, okay, yeah, we'll see about that, but I'm not going to worry about it because why should I? I mean, crime happens all the time. I can't solve all of it. I'm just a goofy dude who doesn't do anything. And you know, like the the girl who's just like, I'm going to go kiss my boyfriend and then a boyfriend shows up and he's creepy and it's, it works. It just, it's stupid. It feels like an authentic small town coming from a small town. It makes sense to me. I like all the characters for the most part. Of course, there's the ones you intentionally hate, like the, you know, like the best friend who's kind of a prude and a little bit of, you know, like promiscuous woman. I think the kids are actually really good. Like they're all kids. They're all teenagers in this, which is amazing to say, because I I know Jamie Lee Curtis is like 19 when she makes this. She looks like she's 30. She just always has that old face. (laughs) It's just insane, but kind of fun. I like the kids. Tommy and Sally, is that the other kid's name? They're pretty, they're, they're not stupid kids. Like, they're like, oh, there's something out there. It might be the boogeyman. We probably shouldn't get involved in that aspect of things. So we're not going to. We're, we're smart kids. That's not our problem. That's not our business. And I think that works really well. And Lori is a capable woman. She actually handles herself pretty well. And I, I like the way that Michael is slowly stalking her, just the way he's peering around corners, the way he is watching her from the, you know, like the bedroom window and he's down by the, you know, the laundry. That stuff's great. It's just scary enough, but not super scary. Like, I won't say this is a frightening film. I don't think it is intense. I don't think it's terrifying. It is a perfectly created masterpiece where it's like we're building our tension. The fact that you see him, it is scary, but it's not this dark, disturbing thing where it's going to take you out of the film because you're like, I don't feel safe anymore. He doesn't feel like a real person, which I think adds to the fact that this is not that scary. And I don't think any of these horror icons are very scary or or I don't mean I'm not like frightened by them. It's got iconic looks that are hard to look at, but it's just a guy in a jumpsuit with a William Shatner mask painted white. I'd never found him scary. He is an intense villain and he is like, you know, somebody that could kick your ass, but he's not that scary. Let's talk about Dr. Loomis, because for some reason, Donald Pleasance gets a lot of play in this and the next movie we're going to talk about. So, <laughs> I I love his character. He is just this insane doctor. I, I'd hesitate to call him a doctor because what is he a doctor of? He seems completely incapable at every turn in every situation he's dealing with. And he's just like, this guy's a madman, I tell you, police chief. We gotta stop him. I've seen the face of death and the devil is lurking behind Michael's eyes. Like, what? <laughs> It's weird, and I guess you could play up like later on down the series where he's like a the, like the devil incarnate or like a demon possessed or whatever the hell. But just the intensity from Loomis is it makes this film. He's just this insane, over the top doctor who at all times is on edge, pissed off and frightened, just packing heat, ready to shoot anybody at any given moment. Like this dude will not hesitate to shoot. I think it's amazing just how insane 
He is, because he's just like, I'll kill you. I don't give a shit. I will shoot you dead right here and now if you come near me. And he eventually does shoot Michael. And I'm just like, yeah, this guy, he's just packing at all times. He is insane. And Donald Pleasance, the legendary actor, one of the funnest, most insane characters in horror, just because he is just this, ins he's impossibly weird. Just this goofy doctor who speaks in riddles and poems and he's packing heat and he's just wearing a long jacket like he's, you know, a detective from a noir film just walking around trying to take down this one guy. It is really weird and terrifying. And let's say this, the kills that are in this movie, there are some pretty good ones like, you know, actually, I know I'm saying it, they're all just okay. This is the one where they're like, we can't do the intensity, it's the cheaper budget, so we'll pick a guy up and show him dying by his feet curdling up, and then they just drop because he's dead. We'll stab him through the chest with a knife and leave him hanging there. We'll slit a girl's throat. Like, the, it looks fine. The rest of them are better, and that's obvious because the technology improves and we get a bigger budget because of the success of this film. It's just like, yeah, the, these deaths are, they're fine. There's nothing special to them. There's nothing iconic about them. I don't think there's any real iconic deaths in this movie, except maybe Michael falling off the second story of the house, which is fantastic, by the way. I think that is insanely fun and insanely cool. So let's talk about that. You know, Laurie and Michael have been kind of in this weird, you know, back and forth throughout most of the film. Laurie does manage to get some licks on him, which I think is very impressive. And then Loomis comes in, shoots him six times in the chest, and he falls off and dies. And yeah, it works. I mean, it goes really fast. Like, this movie is 90 minutes. It is very slow in the first, I think, 30. And then right after that, when it's nighttime, it picks up and it goes for the shots. And I think that is really cool and really intense. So this film... It works on every level. I think the tension is great. The acting is great for the genre it's playing. And I'm not going to say it's brilliant. Obviously, Donald Pleasance just goes above and beyond with his absurdity. And Jamie Lee Curtis is coming into her own as the, the woman who did this trope. And it, the film itself, it just it's just fun. It's just engaging and intense and just really interesting to see what created this genre and how it came into fruition. So I think that's a really good movie. The score is great. The intensity is great. Everything about this film on every conceivable level worked in the way it needed to. There was great death. There was great action. Our villain became iconic just by looking like a freak. We don't see his face, and I think that works really well. And then... Like all great things, they eventually fall downhill. We go to Halloween 2 in 1981, which takes place the same night. So Michael falls off the building. He gets shot six times. His body is nowhere to be found. Okay. <laughs> so then Halloween 2 happens. Where do we go from there? Well, Lori gets rushed to a hospital because she was attacked and she was injured. And then half this movie... <laughs> this movie is awful i'm just gonna say it right away this is such a bad made film it doesn't do anything good it doesn't it's so weird it's a weird choice that i think will become a trope for the genre of halloween itself where it's just like our second film makes no sense and it doesn't add anything special so Lori's getting dragged off to the hospital. She's in a hospital bed for a majority of this film. And then it cuts to this really weird side story. We have the chief of police whose daughter was killed. He says, I got to go deal with my dead daughter and my wife because, hey, it's the 70s and I, I'm just a loser. So this new guy comes in to take over the role of chief. Now you could look at it as like, oh, this guy didn't want to come back for the sequel, whatever. So this new guy is working with Dr. Loomis. And basically it's just like, let's follow these two guys who are so bad at being detectives and doctors, struggle to identify anybody. One random police officer literally runs into a guy with his police car. He blows up and they're like, oh, we killed Michael Myers because he's wearing a mask. It's like that could literally be anybody. So half that storyline is just them getting the dental records of this man that was killed to make sure it's the Michael Myers. And of course it's not because they just killed a random dude. And when they hit him with the car, the car blew up. And I'm just like, this is stupid. And it's dumb. <laughs> I'm just like, oh man. Oh, so, so dumb. The other part of that story is Loomis is pretty much just being interrogated like he's like you're out of your jurisdiction here man you're getting like court-martialed or something you got to get out of town literally everyone wants you to leave loomis he's like no i will not leave until i get michael 
why? <laughs> we get it. You're, you're his doctor. You know him better than anyone. You can't add anything to the situation to make it better or worse. You're literally just a nuisance at this point. So stop trying to be the hero and let these people get to safety. This is a, the Donald Pleasance like lead movie. And it's just weird that it's the same night. And now we're just doing like the follow up. That's never worked. When has that ever been what you wanted from this genre? You know, where you're like, oh, immediately, the thing that makes him scary, he got away after we shot him and he fell off a building. That's a great way to leave your first film. What's your second film? Immediately after that. What? Where's the tension? Where's the stakes? Now we just know everything worked out fine. So what's the point in having any tension there? So Donald Pleasance is being a really shitty detective gumshoe type. We cut over to the hospital that Lori is at, and we follow the crew of the hospital. The ambulance drivers, the nurses, the woman who watches the babies, the security guard. <laughs> Why? Why? It just reminded me, like, you remember Scream Queens when they had their first season at, like, the college dorms and everything, their second season went to the hospital, and you're like, this doesn't feel right. Why are we doing this? I guess it works a little bit better because Lori isn't working at the hospital. She's literally a patient, so that's okay-ish. But this just was so bad. Like, I'm, who cares about these characters, for instance? They've literally become the trope of the thing they've started. You know, it's like, this guy's a dick. He wants to sleep with this girl. They're going to hook up. Literally, the guy that we're supposed to like, I think his name's Jimmy. He's like our lead, like, you know, heroic man. He wants to, like, protect Lori. He's trying to get with her the whole time. Yeah, it, it's weird. <laughs> He's just like, I'm going to hang out in your hospital room while you're literally recovering from being stabbed. What is wrong with you two? <laughs> Read the room. And the nurse is like, dude, get the hell out of here. This woman is literally in shock and your presence doesn't matter. Let alone the fact that they had to specify that she was in high school and he's in college. That's weird. Thanks for that, dude. You weirdo. And again, it's the sequel. So we have a little bit more money and a little bit more time to do some elegant things. The death scenes are slightly more iconic, but not that much. I think the most iconic thing in this is when Michael is like burning one of like the, you know, more promiscuous nurses in like the boiling like jacuzzi, whatever it is. I, there's one thing that always bugged me about that. It's burning the acid off her face, right? It's just, it's burning her face off till there's nothing left. Why isn't it burning Michael's hands? We know he's human. He's fallible. Why isn't it burning his hands when he's dunking her in this boiling water? That was always weird to me. The other weird thing to me about this too, there's a bunch of weird stuff about this one. But one of the weird things to me was like, okay, Jimmy is our hero for lack of a better term. But we don't actually see Michael kill him, right? We see him <laughs> we see him slip in blood because a nurse is dead and her blood was dripping. He slips in the blood, hits his head, stumbles out onto the parking lot, gets in the same car that Lori's hiding in, and he collapses dead on the steering wheel. What? <laughs> How did that happen? We didn't even see Michael touch him. That guy's just an idiot. He just like passed out on the steering wheel and died, assumably. Maybe he's alive. I don't know. I haven't seen Halloween 3, The Return of Michael Myers or whatever it's called. I don't care. I'm just like, what a weird choice. And all of these characters are so unlikable. The most likable one is the security guard. But he is... A second off with the security guard, he leaves a nurse like to guard his station as he goes to investigate a break-in somewhere. That nurse has no idea how to use the walkie-talkie, and she's got places to be. So you literally set yourself up for failure there, dude. Why would you even put your trust in this woman? What is she going to do to help you? Absolutely nothing. You're going to fall apart here, dude. And it, it leads to his death, and he dies. That's it. He's just dead. The security guard is dead. It all just falls apart so horribly. And we do get a returning character in this film, actually. Remember the nurse or the, whoever the hell from the first movie that's working with Loomis? That sexy lady playing off his literally stubby, angry 40-year-old man energy? Yeah, she returns to tell him, the, the government wants you out of here, boss. And he's like, I won't stop until I get Michael. Michael's hardly in this film either, which I think works when you're doing the sequel. Because then you, you did like your intensity at the end of the first one. But what's your intensity in the second one if we already seen Michael all that time? So showing him the shadows, it, it works better. But there's a big plot point of this film 
that I think is carried over. I don't even know until which one, and then they reboot it and then redo it again. It's carried over enough. So the reason, the reason Michael has been after Lori this whole time, because he knew this, Michael knew this, and Lori has memories of this like reemerging throughout the film. The reason that Michael's after Lori is because she is their sister. So Michael killed his older sister. He had a younger sister, but that sister after the parents were, I guess, just tormented by the loss of their one and put the other one away, they were adopted. So Lori was adopted by the Schroeds, thus making Michael and Lori brother and sister. And Michael, I guess, wants to kill her for that reason alone. I get it. I understand how in the second film you got to make it personal but it's a really, really shitty way to do it. And it plays no factor, really. It's a mid plot point because then it shows like, this is why Lori is becoming the target. That is why. And there's like, Michael's like leaving clues around the school and everything to be like, this is what I'm doing. I don't know why he didn't do that in the first one, but that's what he's doing here now. He's like, I'm doing this. This is what I'm up to. And I'm like, yeah, that's great, dude. What is wrong with you? <laughs> it's just so so stupid and it doesn't work and it just falls apart on its own concept of being something ridiculous and silly i don't think it works in the slightest and it just leads to a very anticlimactic chase which happens in every one of these films every one of these movies ends with this really bad chase where laurie is running away from michael myers and we're just through a hospital it's so slow and dull that you it's so skippable. And, and I think what makes these work is that they're 90 minutes and you don't have to spend a lot of time with these characters. But they're just so dull. <laughs> and you just, you don't really want them to succeed or to survive. You're just like, you just stop. You're not winning. You're not helping anybody. Nobody cares what happens here. So at the end of the day, I guess they blow up Michael. I guess they win. They kind of kill him. Loomis, like, again, takes the, you know, the victory lap and kills him and Loomis kill you know it's a really anticlimactic ending because we literally did the same thing three years ago and now we're just doing it in a hospital with characters who who suck more it's dumb and the, the Laurie and Michael connection just doesn't work Jamie Lee Curtis hardly does anything in this film which I get it. I don't think she wanted to be known as the Halloween girl for the, her whole career which is completely understandable and I think now uh, not in the early 2000s, because we'll get to that in a bit here. I think now she has accepted it that this is going to keep her employed, and she is going to be willing to do it. I don't even think she plays a big role in Halloween Kills, but good for her, and good for this movie, I guess. It was the second in an installment of something that would span generations for some reason. Uh, this never ended. They never stopped making Halloween films since this, and it's just... I don't know if it's... I would say it's... The, wor the worst of the two, clearly, but... <sighs> so, there were a bunch of films in between the next one we're going to talk about. There was the... the uh, who cares? There, there's just a bunch. We're talking about this because of AMC, so thanks AMC for releasing the, literally the worst film I've ever seen. So, we've talked about a lot of films on Movie Tales. You know, the one I think I liked the least was Cool World. I think it was so obnoxious and gross in a way I wasn't expecting. It was just a completely mad story I didn't like. But the worst film we've ever talked about on Movie Tales has to be Halloween Resurrection. So, it's 2002. What are things that are big at the time? I'll tell you. Scream. I guess. I know it was years before, but whatever. The Blair Witch. Yes. That was scary. The Blair Witch was brilliant. Yeah, remember? VHS. Who doesn't love a good old VHS? That's fun. Also, email. Remember when email became the big thing and now it's just standard practice? Yeah. Well, the year's 2002. Before this movie, we had another Halloween movie where What's-Her-Face returned. Laurie Strode returned. She thought she killed Michael Myers, but she didn't. She killed a random boy. And I say, boy, I mean an adult man. So she... Locks herself in an institution, and Michael Myers comes back to kill her. So here, here's the thing about Halloween Resurrection that everyone needs to know. Jamie Lee Curtis agreed to do this film if they would kill off her character, if they would Han Solo her, per se. So the first 15 minutes of this film 
are Lori escaping a hospital after refusing to take her medication because Michael's coming to kill her. She goes to the roof, lures him up there. Literally, you know, Bugs bunnies him, hangs him by a rope and has him hanging over the side of the building. But for some unknown reason, some unknown reason, who's to say really what the reason is for the absurdity that happens in this? For no reason whatsoever, Lori, instead of killing him there like she's planning on doing, walks up to see his face because that's important for her all of a sudden it backfires and Lori gets pushed off the building and dies yep jamie lee curtis dies in the first 15 minutes of this halloween movie and then you're just like oh what's gonna happen next what exciting adventures are we going to get into are we gonna follow some like old school characters from the first movies coming in and like seeing like what they did to Lori? it's gonna be like a revenge story no, not at all. Here's what happens in the rest of this Halloween movie. This is the shortest one. It's 89 minutes. Here's what happens in the rest of this Halloween movie that I'm sure none of you should ever watch. Busta Rhymes and Tyra Banks decide we're going to be internet famous on our site, dangertainment.com. We're going to cast a bunch of high schoolers to go stay in the Michael Myers home overnight and and we're going to prank them by having Buster Rhymes dress up as Michael Myers and scare them. However, inside the house as they're filming this is Michael Myers, and he decides, oh, I'm going to kill these kids because they're in my childhood home. I know what you're thinking. How can a solid premise like that fail? Easily, actually. <laughs> this is... The dumbest thing ever. And it only exists because they want to show off new technologies with, you know, like video cameras that we can stream immediately online and all this crap. All these things that we do daily now. Back when this film came out, I guess they were big. Because every kid is hooked up to this stupid camera on the side of their ear that lets everyone see what they're looking at. We have the most bland cast of characters staying in this room. So who do we have? Let's see if I remember all of the characters that are like in this stupid movie. There's Buster Rhymes and Tyra Banks. Those two are here. Then Katie Sackhoff plays, I'm the cool girl who's popular. I'm going to get the most views. Then we have the, the black kid who's like, I'm cool. I'm fun, but I'm a little bit nerdy. Then we have the brunette girl who's just like, yeah. Then we have the redheaded girl who's just like, I'm a little fun, but not as fun as Katie Sackhoff. Then we have the guy who looks like he's from the band Green Day. He's just like, yeah, what's up? And then I believe we have somebody that looks like Fred Savage that's not Fred Savage. And they're all in this room. <laughs> it is it is a drag. Like, it starts off, they're in high school. They get out of high school. They win the auditions. They go to the auditions again. And then they're just, like, breaking all this crap. And it is just the slowest and dullest thing you've ever seen. And to add insult to injury when it comes to this film, there is a really really stupid subplot with this this younger high oh no they're in college yeah this group is in college and then there's a younger high school kid who's a dork and you can tell he's a dork because he likes to play on computers and he has posters of science fiction stuff in his room he is like best friends with the one brunette chick and they talk online all the time because he helps her with like online proms and being like a part of college or whatever. He calls himself Deckard to hide his identity and she doesn't know what he looks like. So he goes to a costume party with his best friend who wants to get laid. He breaks into some guy's, I guess, office, live streams the night at Michael Myers' house and through texting by email, he tells brunette haired girl what to do to evade getting killed by Michael Myers. And at the end, there's a big news report where she just goes, thanks, Deckard, you saved my life. And he becomes the coolest dude at this high school costume party. <laughs> this is literally the plot of the movie. And it's, what is Halloween about this? It is just trying to like cash in on those tropes of the time where it's like yeah man we'll do like found footage style and you know like the fuzzy blurred out screens half this movie looks like shit like it all looks like shit but half the movie is like out of focus in shaky cam in stupid old vhs looking stuff like it looks so bad and i don't think 
I don't think that was needed. Like, you could just say, we have top-of-the-line equipment for this. Why does it have to be this old-looking shit that's just terrible to look at and just the worst? And, of course, this is filmed in 2001, I'm assuming. So, the violence looks better. You know, the kills look great. Everybody, you see their throat getting slit. It looks good. And it, it looks professional and well done. Everything else isn't. You know, the acting is just terrible. And you could play into the fact that maybe it's intentionally terrible because they're supposed to be realistic college kids who aren't actors. That could be something, in, you know, to deal with. But it should say something that the best actor in your film is Busta Rhymes. <laughs> Busta Rhymes. <laughs> I can't even... I don't I don't get it. I don't get it. Who said this is where it should go? And uh, of course, you know why. So it's a Miramax thing and I don't think Miramax did the original ones, but you just see the Weinstein's names come up in the opening and you're like, "Okay, I see why this was made because I think it parodies a bunch of other movies that Miramax was a part of because I think some guys, yeah, the the, the two Deckard and his wanting to get laid friend dress up as Jules and, and and Vincent from Pulp Fiction. Because kids like that. <laughs> and I'm just like, what, what a weird reference for this movie. I understand why these kids would like it. I don't understand why the audience watching Halloween Resurrection would give a shit about that. Because <laughs> it is just absurdly pointless. Absurdly pointless. <laughs> it is... It is so bad, and it was just a slug to get through. Even at 89 minutes, this could have been 20 minutes at best and just be like a weird internet thing. Actually put it on the internet. It was slow. It was boring. The tension is not there. The kills look good, but they're sloggy and dumb. They, nobody wins in the end, and it ends again on a cliffhanger like, you can't kill Michael Myers. Well, why do we keep making these then? Why do we keep coming back to this property? You know, I think after 10 movies, there's going to be a dip in quality, but I don't think many do it the way Halloween does, where it starts at the top, it defined a genre with great acting, great characters, great suspense, great thrilling action, everything about that first Halloween movie worked. Jamie Lee Curtis, Donald Pleasance, they made it work. It got a second movie that dipped in quality because it focused on the wrong stuff, and then it just went downhill until we ended in the early 2000s with this ridiculous premise focusing on lame high school kids and college kids with found footage inside a stupid house all getting killed because they're incompetent and dumb. It is embarrassingly bad and it just falls apart at every conceivable second. Nothing about this film is fun. Nothing about this film is engaging. And Halloween Resurrections is officially the worst film we've talked about on this channel so far. Nothing about this is redeemable. It's so bad, Jamie Lee Curtis asked to die. <laughs> and I think that's telling because she came back to do another one of these 16 years later. It is so insane. And it amazes me that these kind of slasher flicks still get made today you know where it's just like this genre still survives they're still using this character michael myers has not lost his popularity but he's had a lot of bad stuff and aside from a really fantastic first outing over 40 years ago the character has done nothing and it's been incredibly boring and lackluster and i cannot cannot believe that the halloween franchise is as strong as it is and it is incredibly sad that it just made this god-awful film as its last one before the reboot. This was painful. So painful. But I do have to recommend watching the first Halloween movie because it's good. It's entertaining. The action is great. The characters are great. The music is so good. And the POV shots are spectacular. That first film was fantastic. You can skip the rest because they're going to put you to sleep. Buster Rhymes was the best actor. Buster Rhymes. Just let that sit in for a sec. Holy shit. <laughs> Holy shit. 
So that is going to do it for this horrific Halloween special. I, I love this. And next year we'll be back talking another franchise, I'm pretty sure. And in between here and there, I might do some more specials like this. We'll have to wait and see. But happy Halloween, everyone. And thank you guys so much for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. As always, you can check me out on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And I will catch you in the next one. Have fun. Stay safe. Good luck. Oh, Busta Rhymes, man. Busta Rhymes.